I speak to you in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. This morning we continue along with what has become a Lenten sermon series through some, a series through some of the gravity leadership axioms. We began Lent unpacking the axiom that there is nothing in or about God that is unlike Jesus. We then moved on to the good news that God doesn't meet us where we should be or where we'd like to be, but right where we really are, wherever that is. God meets us in our reality, whatever it is. Then last Sunday, we celebrated that God cares more about the things that concern us than even we do. A truth that can free us to live with open hands before him instead of hands that are constantly grasping for blessing. But this morning's axiom I want to look at is that God does the same work both in us and through us. Said another way, God can only do through you what he has first done in you. Our greatest ministry to others is the witness of our own lives, our own very lives. But the good news is that our most powerful witness comes not from the level of moral performance that we achieve, nor is it in the level of biblical knowledge we attain, or in theological answers we presume to have. It is not even, our greatest witness is not even in the extent that we serve others. Rather, it solely depends on the extent that we've been willing to get honest with God about our own brokenness and allowed him to minister to us. Our greatest witness solely depends on the extent that we've been willing to get honest with God about our own brokenness and allowed him to minister to our souls. I turned 39 years old today. (laughs) But when I was 29, when I'd been here about a year or so, I remember having this revelation one day that some of what I was preaching about, to all of you who were at least here, Some of the good news and promises of God that I was preaching to all of you from the scriptures, I was struck that some of these were not actually realities in my own life. I believe I was preaching something about that abundant life verse, Jesus promises in John 10. I remember thinking to myself, I don't think I really have this. I'm not sure I know what it even means. Here I'd been to seminary and read all sorts of books and gained some knowledge, learned skills to be a priest. But to be honest, much of the Christianity I'd inherited was little more than training in moralism, in having a lot of what I thought were the right answers and lording them over people, in culture warring against non-Christians and their ideas, highly skilled at that. I had what felt like a lot of certainty, but not a lot of internal peace. I had what appeared like righteousness, 
but not a lot of love. In some ways, this realization sparked the beginning of a journey for me in seeking to get honest about that, to bring that brokenness before God. The distorted views I had of myself and of him And to begin a journey that will hopefully be a lifelong one of allowing him to minister to my soul and gradually help me to see him more clearly. To live not with the impression of God I'd been given by Christian culture, but to live before him as he really is, revealed in the person of Jesus in the scriptures. And to slowly begin to let him root out the things in my character that are not like him. And there's a whole lot of that work left to be done. I'm sure you can observe. But you know, I recall, and you'll have to forgive me. I mean, it's my birthday. I'm getting reflective, I guess. I don't know. (laughs) I recall at that time, just a year out of seminary, I recall thinking that my job or calling, if we want to be pious about it, My calling was to be competent as a preacher, to be capable at celebrating the Eucharist, maybe learn a few methods for counseling people through this or that problem, and to achieve the goal of growing the church bigger and bigger, and probably my ego along with it. But what I believe now is that the greatest ministry I can offer to anyone else is to continue seeking to see Jesus more clearly myself. To trust that continuing to follow him and live in union with him will make me more like him, even if in very small increments. And as I learn to live in a place of greater spiritual and emotional health, to try to share with you about what I'm learning But I wouldn't say that's unique to me, that it should be unique to me. I would suggest this should be true for all of us who are followers of Jesus, clergy or lay. Our greatest ministry to others is the witness of our own lives. And the strength of our witness depends solely on the extent that we're willing to get honest with God about our own brokenness and allow him to minister to us. That's it. Many of us who are earnest about our faith have often prayed that God would would use us for the expansion of his kingdom out in the world. But the gravity guys point out that a common mistake behind this mentality, this well-intentioned prayer, is that it can locate God's kingdom project as being something that God, something outside of us, and something that God can just do through us kind of these vessels, without doing in us. However, our role in the building of God's kingdom as individuals and corporately is not merely to be God's workers, to get stuff done. If that's all it was, God could do it himself, right? No, God's project of building his kingdom is us. We are the locus of that project. We are the project. The transformation of our very lives by learning to rest in God's love and live in his grace is the foundation of his kingdom coming on earth. And yes, as God brings about change in us, fruit comes from that, right? We may do good works that he's prepared for us out in the world, But for for those works to really be of him, it must come from what we've first received ourselves of his love. What we've received of his grace in here. Or else it's just performance. He may use it, but kind of despite us. We see in our passage from 2 Corinthians today, St. Paul writes in verse 14, he writes about God using him. But he then quickly makes clear that what God uses in him and all these believers he's writing to, what God uses is the believer's very life. 
Paul says in verse 15, for we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. God's plan, his kingdom project, is for us to take on the very aroma of Christ and through us to spread, through just our presence, right? Not even what we do, just the way we live in this world and in situations to spread the fragrance, fragrance of himself everywhere we are, everywhere we go. So God's project isn't using us to get stuff done. God's project is us. And his plan is that as he ministers to us, that he uses that very presence, our changed way of being in the world as a witness to himself and his goodness, his grace and his love. Our greatest ministry to others is the witness of our own lives. And the strength of our witness depends solely on the extent we're willing to get honest with God about our own brokenness and allow him to minister to us. But what we've really been addressing this Lent is how we can move out of postures towards God and ourselves, postures toward ourselves, how we view ourselves, how we treat ourselves, postures that inhibit us from really living freely in communion with God, right? We talked about how living with an image of God as a demanding judge will cause us to hide from God in our badness, we talked about our tendency to believe we have to transform ourselves first before drawing near to him. Very common, really subconscious thought. Most of us wouldn't say it out loud. We just kind of functionally might live that way. We talked about how others may have a, a, a different struggle, have a distant deity or doting grandfather image of God who doesn't really care much about our sin. And so the notion of change is, what are we talking about? And we talked last week about grasping for blessings, about living as if we have to garner blessings for ourselves instead of living with open hands, receiving the better blessings, because they're his, the blessings God's waiting to give us, which is what we really need. When we live with these postures, it limits the extent that our lives are an aroma of Christ, right? Right? When you're around somebody who lives as if God is a demanding judge, that's going to be a person who interiorly, interiorly, is that a word? Treats themselves like a demanding judge and therefore treats others like a demanding judge. And there ain't no aroma of Jesus in that, right? So all these false images of God or of what we may have come to believe that life before him has to be like, they really just, all they do is leave us enslaved in our sin rather than on the path of becoming more like Christ. So this is why it's so important for none of us to live like we've arrived or to just assume we have the Christian life figured out or that we already know all the abundance that is to be found in Christ Jesus. I assure you, none of us do. Instead, we must remember that it is a life of following, of Jesus by his Holy Spirit continuing to lead us into all truth. And each one of us have so far to go, and that's okay because we live in his grace. God can only do through us what he first does in us we can only impart to others what we first receive ourselves. We reproduce and multiply who we are, right? The way I live before God is the way my kids are going to learn to live before God. In this position, this role I'm in, it's going to be imparting to you guys and modeling to you guys how to live before God, right? Wherever we have authority, we reproduce and multiply who we already are. Unfortunately, there are all too many negative examples of this truth <laughs> that we reproduce and multiply who we are. Some of you will recall that back in 2020, I did a two-part series 
on the role of the church and Christianity in the Rwandan genocide of 1994. What was so unique and disturbing about the Hutus killing 800,000 Tutsis is that almost all of them, those killings, were perpetrated by Christians upon fellow Christians. In some cases, the murders occurred in the very church that they worshipped together in before that. And yet, if you recall, those of you who are here, you know, most from the outside assume that the genocide was the bubbling over of centuries-old animosities between two groups. But this was not the case. In fact, there is not any record at all of group violence between Hutus and Tutsis until the arrival of European missionaries in Rwanda at the turn of the 20th century. But because the brand of Christianity that the Europeans brought was intertwined with the pernicious ideology, the myth of race, their racial ideology compelled them to assume one of these tribes was superior to the other. They just had to figure out which one. They decided. They picked one. And the seeds of genocide were planted, even if they didn't fully germinate until a century later. Our greatest ministry to others is the witness of our own lives. What we bring is both the good and bad of how we relate to God and how we understand his truth. But if we're willing to continue seeking the kingdom, to take our brokenness seriously by assuming that we have blind spots and to be ruthless about making Jesus the lens we read all scripture through, not Christian culture, Jesus, his very life and teachings, then our lives will begin to take on the aroma of Christ and his fragrance will, fragrance will spread through us wherever we are. We can only lead people into something we have already received or experiencing, or experiencing. The gravity guys say the sort of embodied mission that we're really called to is, it's much more like telling people about the amazing restaurant you dined at last night than trying to sell timeshares at a resort you never planned to visit, right? We eat at the restaurant, right? We eat from the, we receive from the Lord and we share what it's done in us, right? This ain't a timeshare racket. This ain't a Ponzi scheme. Well, it can be, but... <laughs> Lord have mercy. So for some of us, see, our tendency is to ask God to work through us without allowing him to work in us. Right? When that happens, we may feel good about it. We may feel significant. But what we really do is we end up actually dehumanizing other people. Even if we're trying to bring them to the gospel or serve them, if it's about feeling significant ourselves, then we've made them into just an object. Meanwhile, others of us may be happy for God to work in us personally, but we resist letting his work flow through us. And there can be a lot of kind of lies that keep us in that place. Perhaps we feel like we have to first achieve some level of moral perfection or biblical knowledge or have all the answers, right? Right? Or perhaps we just lack a willingness to be a blessing. We want to receive from God, but don't let it flow out. Perhaps we lack the confidence that we are a blessing. Right? I try to tell people when they don't come, you know, for whatever reason, we miss out, right? When they aren't here, when they aren't part of the body, we miss out from them. We miss out the blessing that they are, and people, oh, no, oh, no. No, you are a blessing. You're part of the body. God is working in your life. We need one another. Say that in Zoom land. We need one another, right? Dallas Willard said the main thing God gets out of our life is not the achievements we accomplish. It's the person we become. 
in my own life, if I had wanted to just play church and have people call me father, then fine. Ten years ago, I was doing at least an okay job at that, right? But if I want to be a disciple myself and contribute not to adding to the number of parishioners, but to contribute to the making of other disciples, my greatest gift will not be what I tell people, what I tell them to think, or what I do for them. My greatest gift can be the extent that I embody the presence of the kingdom of God in myself. And Lord knows I got a long way to go, but that's the goal, right? The same goes for all of us, right? This isn't a clergy thing. If we want to lead people into the life of the kingdom of God, it begins with allowing God to teach us to live in that kingdom ourselves. And so I'll say it one last time. Our greatest ministry to others is the witness of our own lives. But the good news is that our most powerful witness comes not from the level of moral performance we achieve or in the level of biblical knowledge we attain or the theological answers we think we have. It's not even in the extent that we serve. It is solely depends on the extent we've been willing to get honest with God about our own brokenness and allowed him to minister to that brokenness. And so this morning, I want to give us an opportunity to respond to what God may be saying through this by leading us through a short time of prayer. Will you bow your heads and pray with me? This time, I want to just invite you in the quiet of your hearts to give thanks to God that the greatest things he desires to do through you are what he first wants to do in you. That he doesn't use you for a project of goodness. You are his project of goodness. Now I want to invite you to think about what you desire for God to do through you. When you imagine that, what do you want him to do through your life? If something's come to mind, would you ask God to show you how you can open yourself, open yourself up more consistently to let him do that same work in you? that you want to see in others? Would we ask God to help us live more in the reality of our brokenness before him? But to do so knowing that's not a posture of despair, but a posture of trusting that he is good, that he's on our side, that he cares more about it than we care about it. Now I want to give you a moment just to consider what God's doing in your life right now. Is there anything you could put your finger on? If anything comes to mind, ask him to show you how you can allow that work he's doing to flow through you more, to be a blessing to others. And if not a single thing has come to mind, that's okay. Just keep asking. Keep opening your life to him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.